But it's good to be back and uh, to be with Converge and to be here at Ignite and, and so excited to be here and really, really, and I'm, I'm not saying that flippantly, I'm saying that seriously. I talked to Lynn, pastor uh, here and, and conference organizer, and we talked some about what he wanted me to talk about. And I was really encouraged because uh, part of what I'm going to talk about today is, is really an affirmation of, of uh, the identity that you've uh, maintained and created and maintained. But also he asked me to go to challenge you to build on that identity. And so we'll do both of those things as we sort of walk through uh, the message today. Uh, as you probably know, it's, it's actually on your Converge uh, website, is I, I have said and I believe that Converge is the, is the, is the leading church planting uh, denomination. I know you like to say movement, and I, I get that because, you know, you know, it's not really a denomination. There's not like a president named Scott who got elected or anything of that sort. It's just a, just a movement. It's random groups of churches tracking together with a headquarters that moved to Orlando in a school that's out there in the hallway, but you're a movement. Uh, but anyway, um, sorry. But if you were a denomination, you'd be the leading mid-sized to large denomination in church planning in the whole country. And, uh, and that's encouraging. That's encouraging. And I want to affirm that. I want to, I, 272 churches for, for in, in five years. I mean, that's, that's encouraging. What I want us to look at, too, is how do we build on that to what God has for us? How do we build on our identity to make our identity more evident, more present, and more really about the advance, ultimately, uh, of the gospel? So I want to talk about four things. We're going to look at Jesus' teachings, Jesus' commissions that I think will help us to think about our identity. And we'll go through those uh, one at a time. And the first thing I want to just start with is I want to start with an acknowledgement of that there's a, a missional identity. Number one, we are sent, right? There's a missional identity. Uh, number one, we're sent. We're going to look at the commissions of Jesus. We'll look at them one at a time here and we'll go through them. Uh, the first one is found in John 20, 21. These are chronologically in order, right? So the first one is John 20, 21, where Jesus says to them, again, peace to you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Has sent she me? I also send you. This, this must be a new translation with which I am not familiar. And I really don't know how to recover at this point. Uh, so let's take that off the screen for just a moment. Because you know the verse, right? As the Father has sent she me. No, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. To get this out of your, our heads, let's say it together. Ready? As the Father has sent me, so send I you. I want to thank the eight of you who said she me just to prove the point and kind of show the speaker that you can read. Um, so as the Father has sent me, so send I you is a, is a key beginning place because it gets to our missional identity and acknowledgement that, that we, our, we are sent, right? And so that's here, but here's the challenge, right? And I do believe that as I look across the landscape, I'm so encouraged by what Converge Worldwide is, uh, has become, and is becoming when it comes to its missional identity, right? So I'm challenged by leaders in your own movement, right, who talk about uh, from our spiritual conversations or, 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 or some of the writings of, uh, of some of your pastors and leaders. And so, so your leaders in reminding pastors and Christian leaders that, that we, are, we are sent. So I, so I want to affirm that, that I think in this room, we get that as the Father has sent me, Jesus says, so send I you. We get that what Spurgeon said is true. Spurgeon said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter, right? So we, so we get that. Every Christian is a missionary or imposter. We might, we might nuance that word a little bit differently because missionary might be defined a little bit differently, but, but maybe we might say every Christian is either on mission or is an imposter. And we recognize that because Jesus has told us such, that, that we have been sent by Jesus, that, that we respond to his sending as Isaiah did, responding to his holiness. And we say, here I am, Lord, send me. So this reverse reminds us that all of God's people are sent. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Right? So we'd say yes to that. But, but, here, but here's the problem. So I want to affirm, but I want to challenge, right? Hebrews 10.24 says, to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Here's what I want to say. Some, as an observer uh, across our kind of evangelical churches, and yes, and converge 
churches as well, is I think this is a pastor idea, but not a broad people practice. I think pastors, in this room, we'd probably get this, right? But I think as we look to the future, as our identity really seeps down into all aspects of the expressions of our churches, I think you'd agree with me, we got a way to go before this missional thing actually is lived out by our people. Now, now, now that's, we see this throughout the scriptures, right? God is a sender by nature. He's sending in the Old Testament, right? Then he, in the New Testament, he, he sends Jesus. And in John 14, 26, Jesus says that the counselor of the Holy Spirit will send him in my name. And so God is by his very nature a sender. Jesus, having been sent 40 times in the Gospel of John, he identifies himself as being sent. And then he says to the people in that room, which relates to us, 2,000 years later in this room, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, the challenge is this, is that it's still a hard thing for people to sort of get because the culture is shifting around us, right? Um, You know, every indicator that evangelicals have historically been known for caring about in culture, every indicator is going the direction that we wouldn't want it to go, with the exception of the kind of the pro-life trend. Uh, that, that's moving a different direction, largely because of scientific advance. People are seeing what an unborn baby looks like. But, but every other trend is going the, the other direction. So what are, what are, what are we going to do? What are we going to do in the situation we find ourselves? Uh, what, what I find is a lot of Christians, a lot of people in your church and mine, what they're doing is they're getting, they're getting mad at the culture as the culture is turning away from them. Because it used to be we were the chaplain to the culture, right? You go back 50, 60 years ago, the church attendance rates weren't much higher. As a matter of fact, church attendance rates in the 40s actually lower than church attendance rates are today. But back then, they'd at least look to us, and we sort of helped set the rules for the culture. We, we decided what was right and wrong, and, and people who called themselves Christians but really didn't live that or mean that or attend in any way in a Christian context, they, they would say those things, and they would say, okay, well, those, those devout people would know. Well, those devout people are now the odd people. We really were never a moral majority, but now we're identifying that we're actually a minority. And not only are we a minority, but we're increasingly being seen as a minority that may be a threat to the society around us. See, that becomes awkward. So what do we do now? We go back to the words of Jesus. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, I know you get that, but, but, but I'm not so sure our people get that. Why? You know why? Because I have this thing called Facebook. And I see their posts on Facebook in my church and yours, and, and I see their posts on Twitter and the vitriol that's often directed at the society and the anger that's directed at somehow they've taken our country. I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. And, 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 and I see this, this hate, and I'm just convinced, my friends, we can't hate a people and reach a people at the same time. And the reality is, is we have to teach our people to live as exiles in the culture where they find themselves, to look to reminders, perhaps in the Old Testament, that we would indeed, we would pray for the welfare of the city, work for its benefit, that we would say, yes to Jesus, here I am, Lord, send me. And I know you get that, but I think we have a long way to go before our people get that. And we have to remind over and over again that we're sent. And so our missional identity is tied up in the sentness of Jesus, but it doesn't end there. Uh, n- number two, I want, I want us to look at an, what I call an ethne identity, and it's to all different kinds of people. So we're sent, number one, number two, to, to all different kinds of people, and I want us to, to get to an ethne identity. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's look to the, to the Great Commission. Let me, let's remind ourselves of the Great Commission. It says, then Jesus came and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven, in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Here, Jesus says so much, whole books, whole commentary series have been written on this verse. It's so important. We call it the Great Commission. I, I think all the commissions are great, but this one's called the Great Commission. Um, so, so what am I focusing on here? I, I want to focus on the phrase, to all, to all nations, panta ta ethne in the original language. See, when Jesus said these words to go to all nations, this is, this is really key. When Jesus said these words to go to all nations, he didn't mean to go to all nations the way that you and I think of nations. Because we think of nations as countries, and there were no countries then. Don't miss this. 
There were no countries when Jesus uttered these words. Why? Because this is an invention of the modern era where we'd have borders and, and customs and passport control. This didn't exist. What existed in Jesus' day was peoples, and there would be these peoples, and there would be the people of Israel. And when Jesus would speak of all nations, they would hear and understand to mean the Gentiles. Missiologists like me have historically seen that as ethno-linguistic people groups. Maybe historically is too strong a word. That's theme sort of arose in the 70s and the 80s, but all different kinds of people, panta ta ethne, is all different kinds of, of people. So what does that mean? Well, that means the Pokot in Africa, that means the Quechua in the highlands of Peru, that means the, the Iban in Malaysia, but, but it also means the, the art community in Scottsdale. It, 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 it also means the, 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 the poor. It means the rich. This uh, this past weekend, I was down in Miami preaching at a church called Christ Fellowship, and it's beautiful to see. About about forty percent of the church is um, is Anglo, what I what my, my ethnic identity, um, part of it at least, and and about forty percent would be that, and then the rest were all just different different cultures and ethnicities and languages and translations. And, and I got to tell you, it gets complicated when it's that way, right? It's so much easier if we all sort of speak the same language, we like the same music, we engage in the same culture. It gets, it gets so much more complicated when other languages and other cultures. And if you don't like that, man, I get it. I get that it can be frustrating, but you're really going to hate heaven. Because on more than one occasion, the writers of Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit point out that this is men and women from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And I want to affirm that Converge has boldly moved beyond Scandinavian heritage. But I think I'd also affirm that we, we'd all affirm that we've got a long way to go till we represent the pantata ethne that's represented actually here in this Scripture text. So what does that look like? Well that, well, that looks like right here. It looks like around the world, right? So we want to be engaged in more cross-cultural global missions. Never hear me say we need less of that, but we also need to engage more of that here, now, in this place, in this space. And what has to happen if we're going to be representative of what the kingdom of God actually looks like is we're going to have to go to all different kinds of people, not just people like us who'd like a kind of a better version of the church they had before. See, the, the year's coming, and it's not that far off, where there's no majority in the United States anymore. Depends on who you ask, 2042, 2040, it's already in the public schools, there is no majority in the United States public schools any longer. So what does that mean for us? You say, well, but Ed, but Ed we have broadened from a Scandinavian heritage and I thank God for that, right? So, you know, my own denominational family, we're, we're trying to broaden as well. And, 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 we, and so there, there's challenges, there's, there's difficulties. But what, but what I, but what I want to say to you is that if we look to this scripture verse, it's going to take all different kinds of people. It's going to take, I, I was preaching a few years ago in a church, I guess over a decade ago now, um, that was in the art district of Louisville, Kentucky. It's, it's called the Highlands of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, the church is called Sojourn. At the time, it was a couple of hundred. I walked into the church, and I immediately noticed, as I did, that I was, I was maybe in my uh, late 30s at the time, and I immediately noticed as I walked in that I was a stranger in a strange land. Um, I actually, uh, I, I, well, the clothes I wore didn't match everybody else. Um, I looked at the band on the stage, and they all had, they all had black jeans, uh, black shoes, black T-shirts, uh, blonde highlights in their hair with big, uh, big thick black rim glasses. There were, there were six of them. All looked exactly like that because they were, they were individuals. Didn't want to be squeezed into a mold by society. Um, <laughs> All of them. Uh, so they were there, right? So I walked in there playing on their, their, their instruments, and I noticed immediately two things. Number one is I didn't know the songs. I found out later that they wrote all their own music. They didn't want to be kind of have the, the man's uh, foot on their neck when it came to artistic expression. And then I found out later, too, that I found out just then, immediately, that the music was was just, uh, it was too loud. Now, now, I will tell you, I planted at this time, before I was, I was a seminary professor at the time, I'd actually planted at that point, what, three, four churches at that point, and I have heard people say to me hundreds of times, hundreds of times, uh, Ed, I'd come to your church, but the music's too loud, and I've thought to myself hundreds of times, I may even have verbalized a few times, man, if it's, if it's too loud, maybe, maybe you're too old. And, uh, 
And as I walked into that church and I thought to myself, that music's too loud, <gasps> I thought to myself, <laughs> I'm that guy. It appears that there comes a time when you switch teams on the volume war. I just didn't know it would be me. So, 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 and I'm thinking, I look around and, and half the church is just filled with people who have, everyone's got tattoos and body piercings. They have, they have little, little uh, studs in their eyebrows and little, little studs in their nose, little chains that go between the two. I just wanted to grab them and pull on it and see if it was real. But it looked like half the church had fallen into a tackle box and came to church that night. <laughs> and I got up and I preached, and I don't know if we connected, but, 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 but afterwards they had, they had two, two young men who had trusted Christ. And in, in our tradition, uh, and in your tradition, we, we, we baptized following conversion. They were new believers. And, and the first one got up and shared about how, how Jesus changed him. How, how he just, he, it wasn't just like in my church, I just asked, you know, have you trusted Christ? They say, yes, we baptize them. But here it's like, give us your testimony in front of everybody, unfiltered. And he starts talking about sexual uh, brokenness and addiction and struggles and, and, and just keeps talking. And then he says, but Jesus came into my heart and he's changed and he's changing me. And, and he was baptized. Everyone applauded. And then a, a few minutes later, next guy got up and talked about a, a broken home that he came from and, and drug and alcohol abuse. And he said, Jesus changed me. And, and he he was baptized, and I thought to myself, this church is nothing like the churches that I pastor. This church is really, I don't know that I would relate well to this church, but I thank Jesus that somebody had heard the words of Jesus, that we are sent to all different kinds of people and planted a church there. And I, and I think you get that. I think as a movement, you get that. I, I think it's past time when people are, you know, lobbing grenades over the methodological wall and converge. And I'm so thankful that you've made such great progress with that. I, but, you know, it, but the part of the challenge is it's, it's more than an openness to contemporary and even alternative expressions. Sometimes it's going back to a people that, man, maybe we wouldn't immediately connect with. See, that one, some of you are like, I want to go to that church. I remember I was in Oklahoma City a few weeks after that, and my plane was my plane was late, and we got there for a Sunday night service. I was teaching at a conference the next day, but I had committed to preach Sunday night service. And I had looked, and um, we came in 10 minutes after the church started, and they were, they were already singing, um, and they were singing um, Victory in Jesus, the Baptist national anthem. And, uh, <laughs> and, and they, but they were singing a little differently. Now, I know you're Converge Worldwide. I know that... There was never a time when you were BGC, but let's say, because now it's like we've always been at war with Eurasia. I know you have, but stay with me. Um, but so, so, so I, I walk in, it's a, it's a Baptist church, right? And it's a, it's, it's, but it's not traditional. It's like traditional in a really weird, creepy way. Uh, but they're singing, they're singing a victory in Jesus, but this is how they're singing it. I heard an old, old story, how a savior came from glory. Yeehaw! How he gave it life. And they actually yeed followed by a haw. I'm from New York City. We neither ye nor do we haw. But they yeed and they, they hawed. And I looked and it was really, it was really strange because the people were seated uh, a lot like some of the guys are over here. There was a, because I couldn't quite see because there was a pew in front. There were pews, right? So, and there, so remember those? Uh, and so, so, so I looked, and I, I didn't know why, but there was a person, and then a space, and then a person, and then a space. Throughout the whole thing, everyone was like spaced, one person apart. And so I looked over the first pew, and it was a person and a hat, and a person and a hat, and a person and a hat. That's Oklahoma. And I got up, and I, and I was preaching, and they started yelling at me. Like, like, I'd be like, and the Lord's speaking to your heart today, and like, preach it, brother, come on, preach it, brother. I'm like, I'm trying, stop yelling at me. You're killing me. I'm trying here. Let me do the preaching. <laughs> yeah, you were there. Uh, <laughs> one guy gets at the back. He just at the end, he goes, yee I mean, that's like the call to, you know, the, the invitation was, yee This was like a cowboy church, and you're familiar with cowboy churches, but this was actually made up of actual cowboys, not people who dress up like cowboys so they can go to church and pretend they are. Not that I'm judging you if that's, well, actually I am. I am judging you if that's where you're, if that's where you're doing. Don't dress up like a cowboy to go to church. Um, 
So after church, we went to, uh, we went to Western Sizzler. It's, it's Oklahoma. It's the law there. And uh, we walk through the, the, uh, the feeding trough line, and we got to my, t- I got to the table, and the pastor was up getting some ice cream. Um, and I'm sitting there with this guy, and his, I don't remember his name. It was Billy, it was Bob. It wasn't Billy Bob. That'd be funny. Uh, but I'd be lying. Uh, and so, so Billy says to me, um, well, we start conversation. And I ask him, I say, uh, man, what, what brought you there? The name of the church was Crossroads or Crossway or something like that. I said, what brought you here? And he said to me, preacher, six months ago I got out of prison. And, and at that point he had my full and undivided attention. Uh, I was checking the silverware. Um, <laughs> and he said... He said, I went to such and such a church. He named a church. I don't remember the name. He said, I couldn't afford to go there. Didn't know what that meant. Maybe their activities. Maybe they all went to lunch after church. He couldn't afford it. Sometimes we're not sensitive to those things. And then, then he said, um, he named another church and said it was clearly they didn't want an ex-con there. And then he said that I came to Crossroads. And his words were, here I got radically saved and washed in the blood of Jesus. And I, and I thought to myself, man, these aren't my people. Because here's, and here's the deal. I mean, I, I, I could handle the music at Sojourn, right? My church today would probably be a lot like it um, in, a, in a lot of ways. But I, you know, and I think God can use any form of music for his glory and honor. There's no such thing as Christian music. There's only Christian lyrics. God can and does use any form of music for his glory and honor except country western. Um, <laughs> amen. Isn't that important? I mean, he could. He has chosen not to because he's a good and a loving God. And he wants the best for you. <laughs> Building bridges with the folks in the Southwest. Uh, um, but I got to tell you, when I went to that church, they sang music I wouldn't sing. And I, I actually, <laughs> now that I live in Nashville, by the way, that my deep hatred of country music is going over real well. Uh, Taylor Swift is from the town where I currently live. So uh, haters going to hate, 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 hate. Uh, <laughs> just shake it off. Um, uh, and I've been to a Taylor Swift concert, I, I should clarify, with my daughters. It would be a little weird if they're like, yeah, I'm kind of a big fan. Uh, but I got to tell you, I got to tell you, um, I think even that would be a little bit harder for us. See, a lot of us, we've kind of fallen in love with a cool way to do church, not with a bunch of lost people in our community. Man, here's the deal. And if you're sent on mission to all different kinds of people, man, don't think that you need to look like this church if you're not in this town. Don't fall in love with with a model of church. Fall in love with the mission of Jesus. And and here's the deal. If that that means cowboy hats and pews and singing victory in Jesus in Oklahoma, and you won't do that for God's glory and for his honor, you have focused on the wrong thing in the mission of God. But beyond that, it's the challenge of what does it look like to to engage a, a growing Latino population? You know, what does it look like to engage Portuguese-speaking Brazilians? Do you, know, do you know the United States, and I know this is a conference that's predominantly geared towards the U.S., the United States, there's more diversity in the United States than there is in any country in the world. It doesn't mean that the United States is the most diverse country, but it means there are more ethnicities represented here than any place in the world. And wouldn't it just be right if in the working of the mission of God, the denomination that's leading the way per capita in planting churches among mid and large denominations would also lead the way to engage the vast number of people groups who are here in North America today. So I want to encourage you, I want to invite you to join Jesus on that mission. They speak different languages, they're all around us, and yet Jesus' desire is is that at the throne, his name would be praised from the tongues of men and women from every tongue, tribe, and nation. So number one, we're sent, number two, to all kinds of people. Number three, I want to talk about our gospel identity. We're sent with a message, right? We've talked about our missional identity, we've talked about our ethne identity. Let's talk about our gospel identity. So we're sent to all different kinds of people with a message, let's take a look at Luke chapter 24 of the commissions of Jesus. This is most likely the one with which we are least familiar, but in Luke chapter 24, verse 46, Jesus says this. He says, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look... I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay 
in the city until you are empowered from on high. Jesus says that repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations. If, if those words make you uncomfortable, you have become too comfortable in the context and less comfortable with the cross. Let, let, me, let me read it again. It says that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed. Repentance, forgiveness, sins, proclaimed. You say, Ed, I have to express those things differently. Okay, if you wanna lead up to them differently, fine. But at the end of the day, if you are not proclaiming a bloody cross and an empty tomb and a call to men and women to repent, to be forgiven of sin and trust and follow Jesus, what you are planting is not churches, it's religious communities without the gospel. At the cross, sin is paid for, but repentance is called for. Now, now why, do, why, why do, I mean, that seems so self-evident and self-obvious. Well, there's a couple of reasons, because there's a lot of great things going on with a lot of great churches, not necessarily in Converge, but I mean, people are engaging well their culture, but not preaching well Jesus' cross. And, 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 I, and, I'm, and I'm concerned about that. I hope you're concerned about this. So, now, now, when we know, when we have confidence that the gospel is being preached, I don't care if in Oklahoma they're wearing hats. I don't even care if you're dressing up like a cowboy on the weekend to preach the gospel. What I care ultimately is that you are preaching the gospel clearly. And, and here's the thing. There's a lot of pressure to move away from that, sometimes from within the church. I, I'm fascinated by this phrase I keep seeing on Facebook from St. Francis, it's alleged. It says, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. How many of you have seen that somewhere in social media lately? Right, okay. Yeah, two problems with that quote. Um, number one, he never said it. <laughs> but don't let that stop you, right? Um, every historian would say, no one even, the, word, the words aren't even quoted until 100 years after his death, and he wouldn't have said it just based on his ministry, but he, ne he never said it. But remember the words of Abraham Lincoln about quotes. He says, don't believe all the quotations you read on the internet. Uh, that's an important tweet right there from Abraham Lincoln. I remember when he tweeted that. Uh, he didn't say it. Number two, can I just say it's really, um, it's really bad theology. Saying preach the gospel at all times when necessary use words is like saying feed the hungry at all times when necessary use food. It's just what the gospel needs to be proclaimed. Jesus says, repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And I want you to know, as I look across my friends at Converge, I am thankful that they have heard the words of Jesus and they're acknowledging their sent, their missional identity, we are sent. I'm thankful that they're increasingly identifying and engaging their ethne identity to all different kinds of people. I am actually quite thankful that they have been clear with their gospel identity uh, with a message. But what I want to say to you is we would be naive at best and reckless at worst not to think that that's going to be tested in the years to come. And it's not already being tested in the people in our congregations. Don't be afraid to stand before them and say, let me explain repentance, let me explain sin, let me explain forgiveness. See, one of the great reasons that maybe we haven't done so much evangelistic engagement, messy people, Judd talked about, is that a lot of our people know the world's messy, but they're not sure that Jesus is the only answer. As a matter of fact, according to a study we did at um, Lifeway Research, I'm contractually obligated to mention one study every message, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, that's not true. Because if it would be true, I'd be mentioning Beth Moore, who's published by Lifeway, and we want you to have, uh, we want you to have your Beth life now. Uh, that's for sure. Um, don't, do me a favor, don't tweet that. Uh, but according to a study we did at Lifeway Research, about half of evangelical, of half of evangelicals, people, our people, um, when answering a question on a survey, will pick the answer that's that's kind of the universalistic, or the pluralistic, or the, univer the answer that reflects universalism. In other words, at the end of the day, they don't, half of the people in our churches statistically don't believe that Jesus is the only way. I hope you do. I hope when you heard the words of Jesus, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, uh, you also remember John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I don't, but I don't worry about this room. I don't, I, you know, I don't worry about this movement. But I do worry about people in your movement and mine who may be hearing us talk about it, but not internalizing the desperate need of a world that's dead in its trespasses and sins in need of a message that includes repentance, forgiveness of sins, a bloody cross, and an empty tomb.
So I'm less concerned about models of church, right? You know, God used the, uh, the house, he's using the house church to reach China. He's used the mega church to impact Korea. And just hold your models loosely, but hold your gospel firmly. Um, let, let's go on to number, number four and finally, I've got I've to I've wrap up, right? So we've talked some first, we've, we've, we've talked first about, about our missional identity, and that's we're sent. Then we talked about our, our ethne identity, and that's to all different kinds of people. And then we talked about our gospel identity, that's with a message. And fourth and finally, I want to talk about our empowered identity, uh, being empowered by the Spirit. Now, now Acts 1.8, you're probably familiar with, but I, I actually want to start a little earlier with this. These, these verses you, you would be familiar with. Um, but let me start a few verses earlier, right? I'm going to read this from a, from a paraphrase that I created, right? This is my own personal paraphrase. We'll call this the, uh, the ESV, the Ed Stetzer version. Um, and, but technically, it's, a, it's a, technically a paraphrase. Um, so Acts 1 Verse uh, 6 says this in the, in the Ed Stetzer version. It says, So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, have you read the latest installment of the Left Behind series? <laughs> it's not really what it says. Um, what it says is, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Can I just tell you, 2,000 years ago, the disciples wanted to ask Jesus, is this the end times? 2,000 years later, people seem to be obsessed with, is this the end times? Um, (laughs) I don't care how many um, blood moons you think there are. (laughs) Jesus didn't put you on the time and date committee. He put you on the welcoming committee. And and, and so I get it, but people love, you know, um, um, you know, people talk about this all the time. Uh, One of the Ortbergs wrote, that if you want to get people to, uh, to come to a church service or a meeting, you talk about three things, right? You talk about, um, I think it was Nancy Ortberg actually said this, you talk about um, sex, and, you know, that'll, that'll draw a crowd. Uh, you talk about the, the end times, right, and that'll draw a crowd. Or you talk about, third thing is, uh, will there be sex in the end times? <laughs> um, that's Nancy Ortberg if you're tweeting that. No, no mention of Ed Stetzer. Needed or welcomed. Uh, But here's the deal. When Jesus heard them, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the periods the Father has set by his own authority. Uh, He says, but you shall receive power. He talked about power for what? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's not like, well, we're going to reach our Jerusalem, right? So Chandler's our Jerusalem. Now, I know people use that, and I'm not offended by that, right? Chandler's our Jerusalem, and then this, this, this district, you know, converged district is our, is, our, is our Judea, and the United States is our Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. I can tell you that that's not what, what Jesus was, was, was saying, because here's the deal. You can't really say, this is my Jerusalem. I, I, was, in, I was in Singapore, and the Christians there, say we want to be the Antioch of Asia. And I felt bad telling them, you know, there kind of is still an Antioch, and it's still in Asia. You can't be that. <laughs> but they use it as a bird picture. I get that, right? So, so you, don't, you don't have a Jerusalem. This, isn't, this is just an outline of the book of Acts. You went to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And Samaria is not the bigger region around Judea. Samaria is the region with people with the wrong morality or the undesired ethnicity that we would engage for the cause of the gospel. And so it goes back to the ethne here. But at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit has to work in us. He has to be heard through us. And ultimately, his gospel has to be preached because we're empowered by him. And when we want to talk about the end times, Jesus wants to talk about these times and God's mission now. And, and I would just say to you, I, I think Christians, including in Converge, man, they love evangelism as long as somebody else is doing it. And we need the empowerment of the Spirit. Can I, can I tell you, I, I really, I have a disproportionate appreciation of your your movement. I really do. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, I say, people say, well, you say that at all meetings that you go to? No, no. I mean, sometimes I, when, I, when I'm at a Pentecostal meeting just recently, I say, man, you guys are just like Baptists, just happy. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so I'm not always nice to our people. But I am disproportionately appreciative of what you are doing. So I don't want to hear anything I'm saying other than, man, you're doing great, but let's, let's, even, let's do greater. 
man, you're, you're acknowledging we're sent. Let's, let's do it more and get it to our people. You, we're all different kinds of people. You, you've made progress. Let's continue to make progress so that, so that Converge Worldwide looks perhaps like the context even where we are in the United States today. Right? I, I'm saying that your gospel identity is, is both clear but has to be maintained. And we have to remember that people in, in our seats don't necessarily have the same understanding and we have to keep teaching it. When you assume the gospel in a generation, you lose the gospel. But we have to do it in the empowerment of the Spirit. So as a friend and as a fan uh, of your movement, I, I want to say to you, um, the work of the Spirit <laughs> has already so powerfully begun. You have become, for in evangelicalism, the example I use when I write books of how a denomination can increase its church planting capacity. But I believe that in the power of the Holy Spirit, He wants to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we've even asked or thought. I have great confidence in, in Scott and Scott Rideout and your leadership, and, and I have great confidence in, in, in you. And so I, 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 I pastor a new church, and I need to close. I've actually gone over time. I'll be, I'll be one minute more. Um, when I moved to, uh, to Nashville, and I, I, my job, I'm something like of a motivational speaker living in a van down by the river. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, um, I volunteer my time. I'm the lead pastor of a church plant. Uh, every, every three out of four weeks, I'm in my church. Last week, I was in Christ Fellowship in Florida, but three out of four weeks, I'm in my church. And I got to tell you, it's not all sunshine and roses, right? I got, uh, we, meet, we have two campuses now. We meet in a movie theater for our, our, our second service, our first and third, meet in a facility in another town. And I got to tell you, there's, there's a lady about the fifth row up on this side who talks to me for no apparent reason during the entire service. Uh, I've got people who get mad at me. Listen, if you don't have 10% of your church mad at you, you're probably not doing anything anyway. You have 70%, tone it down a little bit. <laughs> but I want you to know that as a, as a church planner, I'm the lead pastor, but I'm not on staff. I'm a volunteer. I'm an unpaid volunteer. I'm here because ultimately I think the Spirit wants to work among people through church plants. And I look to you, and I'm thankful for your example. I wonder if you might take a challenge to say, thank God for what you've done, but not ask the Lord for what he would have you to do. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you for the men and women here, the churches they represent. And Lord, I pray that in some way this message might provoke them to love and good deeds. Father, I pray that they would acknowledge again our sentness. Would you do that just with your head bowed and your eyes closed? Would you just say, thank you, Lord. We, we acknowledge that we are sent. We acknowledge that you, Lord, have sent us for your kingdom's purposes. And would you ask the Lord's grace to help share that anew and afresh with your people? Not a pastor idea, but a people practice. Would you, just in the quiet of this moment, would you ask the Lord to broaden the ethnicity of your church and of this movement? Would you just say, Lord, I, I pray next year, not that there'd be less people here, but the more people that would be here, that they would, <laughs> they would speak Chui, that they would speak Russian, that they would speak Spanish, and that we might look around this room and see Asians and African Americans at a greater level than we even do now. And we'd have greater representation of Latinos. And all around us would be a reflection of heaven where men and women from every tongue, tribe, and nation worship you. And I pray, Lord, that you'd remind us that the gospel message must be clear that the tendency is to lose it. And we might not assume the gospel and thus lose the gospel, but we might, as Jesus said, be unapologetic and unashamed about words like repentance, forgiveness of sin, proclaimed to all nations. Help us to serve the hurting at a greater level. Help us to preach the gospel unceasingly, unapologetically. And Father, help us to do this in the power of the Spirit. Just with your head bowed, your eyes closed, will you just... Would you just ask the Lord's, the, his spirit to be at work in you? Would you just, Holy Spirit, come, guide, refresh and lead me so I can go home refreshed, empowered, and can lead a congregation to acknowledge again our missional identity, our ethne identity, our gospel identity, and our empowered identity. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen.